If you survived the absolute disaster that our studs brought us in week 15, congratulations, you're moving on towards a fantasy championship. But the real question mark now, will our running backs be able to carry us to victory in week 16? I'm gonna break it all down for every single matchup right now. Yo, what is going on, Headliner Nation? For a majority of you watching right now, you're either starting your fantasy playoffs or you're one win away from heading to a fantasy championship game. Our running backs this week are going to be a huge key factor in whether or not we bring home a trophy this year. But before we hop into that information, we have got a special message from the sponsor of today's video, Marine Lair, and Taylor's gonna tell you all about them. Hey everybody, it's Taylor back again to talk about Marine Lair our sponsor. I really do love their clothes. I'm wearing this shirt. It's from there and it's been through several washes already. Still insanely comfortable, holding up super well. Uh, I don't even take it off to sleep anymore, honestly. But for real, last time I talked about the Respun program and I went ahead and signed up for this tea recycling kit. I'm going to throw several of my old t-shirts uh, from the back of my closet in there and send it in and get a credit because I've got my eye on a few things on their website that I uh, probably going to put on the Christmas list or maybe just buy myself for Christmas, honestly, with that credit that I get. Uh, but with the holidays coming up, Marine Layer is giving a special discount to Headliner Nation. We actually have like our own link now. So you can go to marinelayer.com forward slash headliners. That's 15% off your entire order at marinelayer.com. Maybe you're looking for a gift for you or somebody for the holiday season. Marine Layer has you covered with literally the perfect gift. You can go once again to marinelayer.com forward slash headliners for 15% off your entire order for a limited time. They're saving your closet or even somebody else's if you're buying a gift, I guess, one t-shirt at a time. Taylor, appreciate you telling us all about Marine Layer. And don't forget, we're gonna be giving away that Travis Etienne autographed jersey we showed last week during the Jacksonville matchup in this video. But for now, we gotta talk about Thursday Night Football, which brings you my Manscaped must watch matchup of the week. Before you settle in for New Orleans and Los Angeles, make sure that you head on over to manscaped.com to finish up all of your Christmas shopping. When you get ready to check out, use code word HEADLINERS and you're gonna get 20% off your entire order and free shipping. When Alvin Kamara and Kyron Williams have been on the field this season, they have been huge boosts for our fantasy lineup. Yeah, we were missing Alvin Kamara at the beginning of the year, but he's been nothing but consistent since then. Kyron Williams, unfortunately, has missed a few games with injuries, but anytime he's on on the field, it looks like he's putting up dynamic numbers for us. Now, neither of these teams give up a ton of fantasy points to the running back position, and neither team is highly successful at stopping the run either, with the Saints being ranked 25th against the run and the Rams being ranked 14th. Alvin Kamara is probably going to have the most difficult time in this matchup. LA can do a pretty good job of stopping the run when they want to, it feels like, but the biggest concern for me is that the target volume for Alvin Kamara has absolutely dropped off since the beginning of the season. In fact, last week when we were missing Chris Olave, it didn't really seem to bump his target numbers all that much. In this game, for him to reach top flight status, we are going to have to get him closer to seven or eight targets and see some heavy work in the passing game. And Kyron Williams is literally performing as a top tier running back. He's getting you all the touches that you need in a game. He's getting you all the yards that you need in a game. He's scoring touchdowns. He is the lead back without giving a ton of touches to other guys on the team. Kyron Williams is really the definition of one of the safest running backs that we can start right now outside of Christian McCaffrey himself. Kyron Williams literally gives you everything you need to have a really stable floor at the running back position and a really nice upside as well. There aren't too many running backs right now in fantasy football that we can trust more than Kyron Williams. Since their bye week in week seven, Joe Mixon has been an RB24 or higher in all but one game, and he has scored a touchdown in all but two games. He's also put together five top 12 performances in that span as well. And going up against Pittsburgh, he's going to have an opportunity to finish inside the top 24 pretty easily once again. The offense really hasn't missed a whole lot since Joe Burrow went down with his injury. Jake Browning has played very, very well. And while Joe Mixon may not have a ton of 
yards on the ground or be super efficient going up against Pittsburgh, scoring a touchdown will be an option once again. I'm not looking for like a top maybe 7 to 12 week this week, but Joe Mixon finishing anywhere from probably 13 to 15 seems highly likely. He's getting a little work in the passing game. He's getting all the runs on the ground and he's getting the work at the goal line, which is what matters most. Chase Brown, not going to really mention him because he's not worth a start. He's got a couple of big plays here and there, but he isn't giving you the volume that you're going to mess with in the fantasy playoffs. The Cincinnati Bengals are ranked 28th against the run right now. So putting a medium risk on both Najee Harris and Jalen Warren seems like the right thing to do. But unfortunately, since they fired Matt Canada, their run game has gotten substantially worse. From weeks 9 through 12, Najee Harris finishes an RB1 three times. But in the three games since then, Najee Harris's highest ranking has been RB22, and he's been outside the top 40 the other two games. Jalen Warren hadn't been a top 24 running back since week 11. Finally, he made it inside the top 24 as the RB21 last week, but still isn't seeing a ton of volume. It's like the run game has just completely stalled for Pittsburgh, and it's probably one of the reasons why they're in a three-game skid right now. Now. The matchup with Cincinnati brings some upside potential, so I can't put either of these guys in red because either of them could break off a big play. Najee probably has a better opportunity to score a touchdown at the goal line, while Jalen Warren could rip off a big play on the ground or potentially through the air. Both of them are going to bring some pretty decent risk with them, though, and if you have to rely on either of them this week, get ready for a top 12 performance or somewhere in the 40s. James Cook is coming off arguably his best career game against one of the NFL's best defenses. And now he's going to get a defense with the Chargers that allows the six most fantasy points to the running back position. Over the last couple of weeks, James Cook has caught fire. James Cook has been inside the top 10 running backs in three of his last four games. And he's going on five straight games with top 24 upside. This guy has given you some absolutely great floor with a really nice ceiling over the last couple of weeks and the hope is heading into the fantasy playoffs or through the fantasy playoffs he continues to do exactly that at times this season we got frustrated it just felt like the bills weren't utilizing him it felt like he was missing out on too many touchdown opportunities but now when it matters most he's giving you the numbers that you absolutely need austin eckler obviously lost a lot of work last week and it's not all on austin eckler getting blown out by 50 something points will do that to your starting running backs. You're not going to get a lot of touches down by that many scores. But in this game going up against Buffalo, with the way Los Angeles has played, I really don't know what to expect. Austin Eckler is becoming super, super risky. We haven't seen his upside in several weeks, and his floor has been absolutely terrible. But who knows? Maybe Los Angeles figures it out this week, and maybe they have a better offensive game plan for Buffalo. Whatever it may be, if you're being forced to start Austin Eckler, you're definitely not feeling good about it. But it's really hard to sit him unless you truly have a better option that you can put in over him. For Indianapolis and Atlanta, I really don't know how we trust any running back in this matchup. As of this recording, still no word on whether or not Zach Moss is going to play. Will Trey Sermon or Tyler Goodson be the next guy up? Who has the safest floor? Who has the highest ceiling? If Zach Moss doesn't play, it's going to lead to some really difficult decisions for us because Atlanta could be missing possibly three of their interior defensive linemen in this game, making the opportunity to get the run game going that much better for the Colts. For me personally, if I want safety, I'm going with Trey Sermon. It looks like he'll probably end up being the starter and have the most carries on the ground. But don't overlook Tyler Goodson's upside. He's more explosive, he's more dynamic, and he's going to help more in the passing game. We'll talk about this more a little bit later on in the week, especially if we know Zach Wilson, whether or not, will be able to suit up. But for now, keep both of them on your radar. And B. John Robinson, you're getting ready to head into a fantasy championship, and you don't even know if you can play one of your highest draft picks from earlier in the year. And it's not all B. John Robinson's fault. He just is not 
utilized correctly, in my opinion. Arthur Smith continues to run out a lackluster offense where it acts like he's trying to outsmart everyone in the league, but he's just outsmarting himself because it's clear he doesn't have a set game plan and it's clear he doesn't know how to adjust his game plan. Now, last week was some sloppy weather and maybe that had something to do with it. Maybe getting Bijan going in that weather is not something that Arthur Smith was looking to do, but I don't know how going up against the Colts, we can't get Bijan Robinson going. The Colts are currently ranked 26 against the run and allow the third most fantasy points to the running back position. Right now, all you can do is start Bijan Robinson and absolutely pray. You spent too high of a draft pick on him. He has way too high of a ceiling and it's way too good of a matchup to go ahead and toss him back onto your bench. In fact, this is one of those games where we look at it later in the year and we go, hey, you know what? Remember when Bijan put up an absolute disasterful performance going up against Carolina and then bounced back the week after against Indianapolis and won me that week? That is exactly what I could end up seeing here. You're either going to love Bijan Robinson for carrying you into the next round, or you're going to hate him because you didn't play for a championship with him on your team. Trusting Chuba Hubbard over Aaron Jones in week 16 was not something that I had on my 2023 fantasy football bingo card. But here we are, and Aaron Jones has been dealing with lots of injuries. And even last week with no A.J. Dillon, he still didn't have a great week. He didn't have an awful week, but you could definitely tell that he wasn't really given the full workload that maybe that we would have liked. And game script really didn't help in that matchup either. But going up against Carolina, it's absolutely going to afford them the opportunity to get Aaron Jones going a little bit more. And for those of you that have been holding on to him, right now, this matchup would be the reason why. While Carolina is ranked 20th against the run, they allow the fourth most fantasy points to the running back position. So the yards will absolutely be there, but the opportunity to score and a little work in the passing game will also help them. And with the wide receivers banged up right now, it absolutely could be one of those weeks where Aaron Jones sees a few extra targets. Fingers crossed. I'm just trying to speak it into existence for you. And for Chuba Hubbard, he's going to get a Green Bay team that has just had an absolutely terrible time stopping the run the last several weeks. Right now, Green Bay is ranked 30th against the run. And this is a team that has allowed the main running back from the other team to run for over 65 yards over the last several weeks in every single matchup. So Chuba Hubbard, who's getting all of the volume over Miles Sanders right now and who has been playing well, is getting a really good matchup for those of you that picked him up and have been holding on to him. He's been a top 24 running back each of the last four weeks, and he's been inside the top 12 in two of those matchups as well. Even if he's not giving you the highest volume that you would like, in a matchup like this where he's going to be getting all of the volume, he absolutely is going to give you a really nice floor and give you RB2 potential for the week. At this point in the season, we know exactly what we're getting from the Cleveland backfield. And after Kareem Hunt looked really sharp earlier in the season, scoring a ton of touchdowns, he's basically been faded to the background. But Jerome Ford hasn't really been doing that great either. When you take a look at his performances, you get some okay low-end RB2 floor with barely a little bit of high-end RB2 upside sprinkled in with it. But that's it, because he hasn't been an RB1 since week seven in the season. Going up against Houston, they do a pretty decent job of stopping the run, and unfortunately, the ground game just hasn't been a strong point for this Browns team over the last several weeks. With Houston allowing the six fewest rushing yards on the season right now, Jerome Ford would have to make his work through the air. And since Joe Flacco took over, it's been a whole lot of Amari Cooper and David Njoku with targets spread all around. It really is up and down with Jerome Ford. You're either going to get less than 15 receiving yards or you're going to get more than 30. But the one thing I know for certain about Jerome Ford right now is if he doesn't score a touchdown, he's barely going to be starter worthy. In PPR leagues, he gives you a little bit more floor. In half PPR leagues, you're really going to be bordering, especially in this matchup, of a low-end RB2, a high-end RB3. Things aren't going to be any easier for Devin Singletary either. Cleveland's defense right now ranked 11th against the run and giving up the 10th fewest fantasy points to the running back position. Now, the one thing that I can tell you that makes 
Devin Singletary a little safer than what Jerome Ford is, is that we know for certain Devin Singletary, based on the usage over the last couple of weeks, is definitely going to be the guy on the ground. And they're going to try to run the football. Where Cleveland feels like they keep trying to abandon the run, and they're just throwing it with Joe Flacco right now. So does Jerome Ford have a little bit more upside than Devin Singletary? Yes, because of his work in the passing game. But Devin Singletary's work on the ground is also going to give him a safer floor, even if the upside isn't exactly where you would like. For the first time in my adult life, I can say that with a win this weekend, the Detroit Lions will clinch the NFC North. And they're going up against the second place team, Minnesota, and that's going to be at the Vikings. So what Detroit are we gonna get? The Detroit that stomped on the Denver Broncos last week, absolutely annihilating them and looking like a legit playoff team? Or are we gonna get the Detroit Lions that lost to Chicago on the road and barely won against them at home a couple of weeks ago? For me, Detroit, it's a lot of Jekyll and Hyde right now. And there's a lot of issues on the defensive side of the ball that could be better with C.J. Gardner-Johnson returning very soon. But this is going to be a tough matchup on the ground for Detroit. Minnesota's defense has played very well against running backs this year. They're currently ranked fifth against the run, allowing the six fewest fantasy points to the running back position. But the one thing we know for certain with Detroit they're going to run the football, and they're going to run the football right at you. And even teams this year that have been pretty good against the run, Detroit still runs the football right at them. Jameer Gibbs, he's got top 12 potential once again. Breakaway speed, big playability, makes people miss, breaks tackles, can help in the passing game. We have seen him on full display here in the second half of the season. And for you that own him in fantasy football, you've really enjoyed that. Now, David Montgomery is still going to be in green for me. And it's not because of his upside, but because Detroit's offense definitely can put the ball in the red zone. And if they're at the goal line, David Montgomery is going to get a shot. But we also know that David Montgomery is probably going to touch the ball at least 15 times in this game. Even if the run game isn't picking up exactly where they would like it to, he's still going to get the volume. He does bring a little bit of risk because he doesn't have the upside that we would like, but due to the sheer amount of volume that he's going to have, he's still going to be inside my top 16 this week, and he's going to be a guy that hopefully still gives us those really solid RB2 numbers. For the Minnesota Vikings, it is looking like Ty Chandler could potentially end up being the guy once again this week, but we still have not heard, as of this recording, whether or not Alexander Madison is going to end up playing. Now, things are not going to be any easier for Ty Chandler. Detroit is allowing the eighth fewest rushing yards on the season and allowing the fewest fantasy points to the running back position. Ty Chandler is in yellow right now because we just mentioned it. Don't know about Alexander Madison and whether or not he'll be able to play this week. Ty Chandler will still likely remain in yellow, though, going up against this Detroit Lions team. Now, the reason that Ty Chandler is in yellow facing a tough Detroit Lions run defense, but David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs are in green facing a Minnesota run defense that's also equally as good is because... Detroit's offense is just better right now. Yeah, you've got Justin Jefferson. Yeah, you've got Jordan Addison. They've looked okay at times. Obviously, they've had a lot of changes at the quarterback position. But over the last few weeks, the consistency just isn't what I would like it to be. And with Detroit, maybe they get beat through the air, but they're stopping the run. And Ty Chandler just doesn't get the amount of volume that we would like for him to be a fantasy safe play this week but he should still rank inside the top 30 regardless. It is super hard to try and anticipate what type of performances we're going to get from any of the running backs in the Washington-New York Jets matchup this week. For Washington, last week looked like prime Antonio Gibson week. He had been getting a little bit more usage in the passing game the few weeks prior to that, and with no Brian Robinson, it really felt like he was going to take over and lead the way. But Chris Rodriguez stepped in instead and really helped push things on the ground while Antonio Gibson was essentially quiet the entire day. And without knowing whether or not Brian Robinson may be ready to go here in week 16, I can't safely start any of these running backs right now. If Brian Robinson comes back and he's fully healthy at the end of the week, then he will absolutely turn into a green start, though, based on the matchup going up against this New York Jets defense that has trouble against the run. Since week eight, Brees Hall has only been inside the top 24 running backs 
twice. One of those performances coming two weeks ago is the number two overall running back based on his work through the air with nine targets and eight receptions. And then this past week, it just came crashing down once again. Brees Hall is the epitome of a roller coaster ride right now at the running back position. We know he has the explosiveness, and we know he has the ability to work in the passing game, but we never know on any given week what we're going to get from this New York Jets offense. It really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Now, is that the Jets' fault or Brees, Hall, Brees Hall's fault? Probably not. The quarterback position play has not been great this year, and obviously they've gone back and forth between a couple of different guys. But it's so hard to throw Brees Hall in our lineup and say, yep, you're the guy that's going to help win me this week. Now, he could take advantage of this Washington defense this week. So his upside will absolutely show once again. And Washington has not done a good job this year of playing in front of their opponents. But this is the New York Jets. And their offense has trouble playing in front of anybody at this point. So when you take a look at the outcomes of Brees Hall this week, really, it could be as high as a top five or running back. It could be as low as not even being fantasy relevant. This past week, going up against one of the NFL's best run defenses, Kenneth Walker showed once again why he is one of the best all-around backs in football right now. And Zach Charbonnet was nowhere to be seen. Walker led the way on the ground and through the air, posting over 100 total yards and scoring a touchdown. And now going up against a Tennessee defense that hasn't been nearly as successful against the run this season, Kenneth Walker could be in for another really nice day and finally find himself firmly inside the top 12. The usage this past week is exactly what we want to see from Kenneth Walker. And now that he's fully healthy, it looks like Seattle is willing to rely on him down the stretch to hopefully make a playoff run. Seattle's run defense, however, has been shoddy at best this season. And now Derrick Henry is going to have the opportunity to have a much better matchup this week and put together a much better week than he did in week 15. Now, really kind of the big news about Derrick Henry this past week was some of the comments he made after their game last week where he really kind of alluded to the fact that he felt like his time in Tennessee was coming to an end. And that quite possibly is going to happen. I would not be surprised if in 2024, Derrick Henry has a new home and Tajay Spears will take over as the lead back. And a lot of people may argue that Spears will be the guy here over the last couple of weeks while Tennessee really tries to figure out what they have with him. I think it's the opposite. What's the point in running your future running back into the ground this season for absolutely nothing when you could give the ball to Derrick Henry and let him finish his Tennessee career, maybe with a bang? I expect to see a lot of Derrick Henry this week, and I expect a very good game from him as well. In fact, I'm willing to put a little money down on that as well because his current rushing line over on underdog is 59 and a half rushing yards. And I'm going to go higher on that number because I definitely think he's in for a big day. And if you're interested in playing any of the pickums that we talk about here on the shows, or if you want to get ready to redeem your fantasy season and put together a playoff best ball team over on underdog, right now is the perfect time to sign up. To get started, download the Underdog app or head on over to their website. Make sure you use code word HEADLINERS when you create a new account and make a first-time deposit. If you make a first-time deposit of at least $10, Underdog is going to match it up to $100 bucks, and you're going to get a special pick to play that is almost guaranteed to hit that will pair really nicely with this Derrick Henry pick -em. And if you don't think that your fantasy season went as well as you would have liked, you've got the opportunity to redeem yourself with one of Underdog's best ball playoff leagues. Make sure you keep an eye out for all that information coming soon. Since his bye week, Travis Etienne has had to play San Francisco, Houston, Cleveland, and Baltimore, all inside the top 10 fewest rushing yards allowed on the season, all while Travis Etienne has been banged up as well. And during that stretch, he did give you three top 24 performances. We haven't seen the upside that we saw earlier in the season since then, but based on the injuries, based on how the offense has looked for Jacksonville lately, and based on the matchups, I'm not super surprised. And this matchup against Tampa Bay isn't going to get a whole lot easier for them. Right now, Tampa Bay is ranked ninth against the run and allowing the eighth fewest fantasy points to the running back position. But if Travis Etienne and your team can make it through this week, 
they'll have the Carolina Panthers next week and a much better matchup to bring home that fantasy championship for you. Travis Etienne has top 12 potential every time he steps on the field because of his big play potential. But we know with how everything is going and the fact that this is a tougher matchup that a mid RB2 week may be his best bet. Jacksonville has been pretty tough against the run this season. They have faltered a little bit down the stretch here, but Rashad White continues to put together some really impressive performances as the season has went on. The efficiency issues that we saw to begin the season are gone. He's scoring touchdowns. He's being utilized with volume. Everything that we need out of a running back to help us bring home that fantasy championship. Maybe his ceiling isn't top five this week because Jacksonville will likely still be a little bit tougher matchup. But if he finds the end zone, he's easily inside the top 12 once again. The tale of these two running backs are basically extreme opposites. For James Conner, we know he's going to get the volume. We know his opportunity to see at least 50 15 rushing attempts is absolutely in play. He doesn't really help out in the passing game anymore, but on the ground, he's been pretty darn good this year. But he's got a tough matchup this week going up against the Chicago Bears. Now, while Chicago does continue to give up quite a few fantasy points to the running back position, they are ranked number one against running backs now. And my biggest issue with James Conner is that he doesn't see the type of volume in the passing game that he used to. So if he's not putting up 70, 80 yards on the ground with a touchdown, he's not giving you fantasy upside. So if you have to play him this week, unfortunately, you're hoping that Arizona can get the ball in the red zone and James Conner can be the one to score because if he doesn't you might only be looking at maybe a ceiling of six or seven fantasy points this week now on the opposite side Dante Foreman has a really good matchup this week but I don't really know how the running back position is going to shake out for Chicago going up against Arizona Khalil Herbert was basically out of the picture last week saw a few touches nothing crazy Dante Foreman was trying to lead the way on the ground, but unfortunately, that wasn't working out. Tougher matchup. Didn't get the yards that we, he would have liked. But Roshan Johnson saw six targets in the passing game, and that's where things become a little hesitant for me. Because if Roshan Johnson doesn't get that work last week, Dante Foreman is in green this week. This Arizona defense is giving up the second most rushing yards this season and the second most fantasy points to running backs. So Dante Foreman would be a super safe start. But what if Chicago, out of the playoff picture, decides we need to find out what we have with Roshan Johnson and send him out there? Now, Johnson is not included on the slide, so hopefully you're listening to this and not just looking at it, because I think Roshan Johnson could end up having a really good day. I'm going to keep an eye on the news coming out of Chicago for the week, and hopefully we get a little bit of word on whether or not Roshan Johnson could end up being the main guy. But if we hear nothing by the time the weekend gets here, then this is going to be a really risky start, whether you try to start Foreman for that safe floor or go with Rashawn Johnson and help for huge upside. A poor performance in week 15 against Buffalo snapped a streak of four straight weeks with top 24 performances from Tony Pollard. And given the fact that they were down by multiple scores during the game, it's not surprising that the run game was not able to get going because even in positive game script, it still doesn't feel like Tony Pollard has been able to get going. And unfortunately, now he's not going to have an easier task with the Miami defense this week. Miami's defense right now is ranked fourth against the run, and they're allowing the ninth fewest fantasy points to the running back position. And if Dallas cannot stay ahead of Miami and Miami can go ahead and put it to him a little bit, we're going to find ourselves in a negative game script once again. So if you're starting Tony Pollard, you're hoping for RB2 numbers and just keeping your fingers crossed that he maybe finds the end zone and stays out of that dreaded RB3 territory. Coming off a week in which the Dallas defense got absolutely shredded by James Cook, I can't imagine that Raheem Mostert and Devonna Chan could not have good weeks going up against them this week as well. And with Tyreek Hill sounding like he will play this week, Dallas's defense is going to have so many eyes all over the place that trying to stop the run could once again give them troubles. If you're looking for the safest start of the two, it's going to be Raheem Mostert. Over the last two weeks, he's proved he's fully healthy, he's good, 
in that Miami is not willing to try and step back in terms of his usage. They're rolling with him right now as the number one as we head into the playoffs. A Chan is really the change of pace back right now, and you're hoping if you play him that you get a couple of big plays here or there. In this matchup, though, it absolutely could happen. Devon Chan is a little bit closer to being a yellow for me than what Raheem Mostert is, but I'm leaving him in green because I know the big playability and the ability to hit a home run at any point will still be there in this game. Zeke Elliott, who was a fantasy savior a couple of weeks ago, disappeared this past week, and that makes sense. But now he's going to get the Denver Broncos, who got absolutely sliced and diced by Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery last week. And on top of that, their run defense still continues to be a huge issue for them. Zeke Elliott is a huge, safe play for me this week. Is his upside going to be as high as maybe some of the guys that I rank in front of him? No, but I am all on board with Zeke Elliott having some top 12 potential this week, just given the sheer amount of volume this guy has seen since Ramondre Stevenson went down. If you have to play Zeke this week, I'd be feeling really good about it because more than likely you're putting him in as like your RB2 or your flex option. And given the safe floor that he has this week, it's absolutely looking good for you to say, hey, he's a set it and forget it type of running back. But Javante Williams, unfortunately, is not going to be nearly as safe. Now, he's in yellow because he continues to get the volume in Denver. And I could see this game remaining pretty close. I don't see Denver getting blown out by the New England Patriots this week. But New England's defense is now ranked number two against the run in the NFL and will cause some problems for Javante Williams to reach a high upside. For me, Williams is more of a flex play this week with a little bit of low RB2 upside if he finds the end zone. So when talking about the Las Vegas-Kansas City matchup, unfortunately, there's a lot of question marks, and it's really going to be hard to figure out what we're going to see a little bit later on in the week. Josh Jacobs, who missed this past week, hasn't really divulged any information into whether or not he'll be able to play going up against Kansas City as of this recording. And of course, if that changes, we'll update it in the rankings. And I'll pin a comment here if it comes out shortly after I drop this video. Isaiah Pacheco is expected to play in week 16, which this seems like the weirdest set of events that I've seen with a running back in a while, because he went from being a guy that maybe just had a sprain and would be fine and would play to all of a sudden needing to have surgery and being out to all of a sudden being back a week after the surgery took place. So I don't really know how healthy Isaiah Pacheco is. I really don't know if they're going to run him out there to try and keep defenses off guard. Is CEH still going to see a lot of carries? Is Jarek McKinnon still going to see a lot of carries? I really have no idea what to expect from this. So as of right now, let's approach this matchup very cautiously. Until we have more information on Josh Jacobs, he's not even going to be a start. And Zamir White, I'm not even listing on here because he doesn't even have enough stats to really show you any type of a picture. So when talking about Zamir White, if Josh Jacobs doesn't play, Zamir White will be a top 30 option for me. If Jacobs finds his way out there, Josh Jacobs will be a top 30 option and will likely be somewhere in that RB2 area for me, knowing that he still could split some touches with White if he's not fully healthy. For Isaiah Pacheco, if he ends up playing, he'll definitely be inside the top 30. And we're talking about a guy that even a week after this surgery could be inside my top 12 or pretty close to it. I'll probably be a little cautious with the rankings. I don't want to get overzealous if he is limited in any way and might keep him as a high-end RB2, but the upside and the potential will certainly be there. You know, just a week ago, this was looking like a really tough matchup for Saquon Barkley and for fantasy owners who were relying on Saquon Barkley to push ahead in the fantasy playoffs. But then Kenneth Walker welcomed Philadelphia into his home last night kicked them in the balls, and had over 100 in total yards. So who knows what we're going to get from Barkley this week. Now, the passing game does look a lot better for Seattle than it does for the New York Giants. And maybe that's a determining factor where if the passing game just isn't as good as we would like, Saquon Barkley doesn't quite get rolling on the ground. But I don't know if having Matt Patricia calling your defense is the best decision 
Lions fan speaking here, for Philadelphia to get back on track. We'll see what happens, but there's not too many running backs in the NFL getting 20-plus touches for Saquon Barkley. And because of that, it does give him a pretty decent floor every single week, even if the ceiling isn't as high as we would like it to be. Now, DeAndre Swift did bounce back and had a pretty decent night against Seattle, but the low ceiling showed its head once again because he ran for 80 yards and looked pretty good on the ground, but he contributed nothing in the passing game, essentially, and he lost out on two rushing touchdowns to Jalen Hurts. Now, one of those touchdowns, he was tackled at like the one yard line. So he was really close to getting in last night. But because there is such a chance that he loses those rushing touchdowns to Jalen Hurts, he's a little bit of a riskier player because if he doesn't give you 100 total yards on the ground, it's really tough to find the upside of around 12 fantasy points in half PPR leagues. Baltimore and San Francisco is going to bring a battle of the top seeds in the AFC and the NFC. And I'm sure this is going to be a great game. And I'm sure Christian McCaffrey is going to be fantasy viable and a safe play for us, just like he has been every other week. You're putting him in your lineup and you're feeling great about it. And just as I'm sure about all of that stuff happening, I'm pretty sure Gus Edwards isn't going to give us a whole lot. San Francisco's run defense is crazy good, obviously. Gus Edwards hasn't had a ton of upside as of recent, and this is a really, really tough matchup with no Keaton Mitchell to kind of help offset things for this offense and give him a little bit of an explosive play value in the backfield. Gus Edwards is going to have to rely on scoring touchdowns. If he can score a touchdown, he might be in the top 24. If he can score two touchdowns, he might be inside the top 12. But really, I don't see Edwards for running over 50 yards in this game, and I still believe Justice Hill will probably see quite a bit of playing time as well. Gus Edwards will be the lead back, and he'll have the best shot at fantasy relevancy for Baltimore, but it's not going to be great. Yo, Headliner Nation, I hope that you appreciated the entire analysis that I gave you for every matchup in Week 16, and we are closing out the regular season here very, very soon. So do me a favor, hit that like button, subscribe if you're new here, and if you have subscribed, stick around for the entire offseason because we're going to have such valuable content for you that you're not going to want to miss out on preparing for 2024. For now, I got to go talk about tight ends. Peace out, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll catch you all in the next episode of the Fantasy Headliners. I'm a headliner.